Greetings. Welcome to the studio, folks. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. This is wonderful to have you, you you're here. Today we've got um, Carolyn Kennett, um, archaeoastronomer, who will be telling us about her readings and her research on um, on the standing stones, in particular in Bodmin Moor, with specific with a specific interest in the Hurlers stone circles, the triple stone circles, which is great. But as usual, before we make a start, um, could you tell me if you hear me loud and clear? Could you give me a thumbs up, please? And also, while you're at it, if you could actually tell me what place you're watching from, either your 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 country or city or town, um, that would be really really helpful. It'll it'll appear in the chat here, so that's absolutely great. Wonderful. Sheila, hi all. Looking forward to this evening. Excellent. That's great. Thank you for being here, Sheila. Ingrid, hi everyone. That's great. Hello, Ingrid. Jackie, Jackie Nowakowski, hello from Truro. And yes, looking forward to Carolyn's talk. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, Jackie. Ingrid from Sweden. That's great. And Sheila from New Key with Steve Hebdige. Excellent stuff. That's great. Thank you so much. Good. Tony's mum from Maryland, USA. Wow, across the Atlantic, fantastic. And Gemma Treadwin, hi Harry, I can hear you loud and clear. Here, near Penzance, wonderful, a local, excellent. Judith Whitehouse, near Penzance, and yes, I can hear you well. That's fantastic, good evening, Judith. And uh, Bara from India, wow. All the way from India, that's fantastic. Well, welcome, welcome to this evening. Thank you so much all for being here. That's absolutely fantastic. As you know, some of you have been here before, um, so you, you know the drill. Um, what we'll do is I'd like you to actually present, put your questions and any kind of comments as we go along. And then during the presentation, during our conversation, I'll bring them in um, so that then we can, we, can, we can actually discuss them and weave them into part of the conversation. Judith, White House, near Penzance, and yes, we can hear well. That's excellent. Um, Ryan, hello. Tuning in from Rain Cross. Excellent, just down the road. Wonderful. That's fantastic. That's great. Cool. Okay, so... Um, if you could actually, um, and, and also feel free to, to engage in dialogue with, through live chat uh, amongst yourselves, if you wish, that's absolutely fine. Any questions or comments, that's, that would be absolutely great. And uh, as I said, weave you, let's weave your questions and comments in part of the dialogue, because I think this is the strength of this medium, to actually make a uh, live chat, that is, to actually make it as participatory and inclusive as we possibly can, rather than have it as a sort of one-way system, um, and we want, to, we want to move away from that. So, enough of me. Without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce this evening's guest, Carolyn Kennett. Carolyn, thank you so much for being here. How are you? I'm very well, Harry. Thank you ever so much for inviting me along. Um, right. It's been an absolute pleasure to come along this evening and chat to everyone a little bit about my research and hopefully everyone will have lots of questions and I might inspire you all to go out and start looking at the night sky a bit yourselves and seeing how it relates to some of the ancient sites in Cornwall. Um, so I'm, I'm going to chat, as Harry said, a little bit about a site uh, called the Hurlers. Um, I know that Jackie spent uh, the hour uh, last week talking about the Hurlers. So if you were here for Jackie's talk, um, you might have got a, a great archaeological understanding of the site now. Um, but what I'm going to do is overlay my research onto that, which is looking at the skyscape at the Hurlers and um, I've spent um, a little bit of time um, researching the, the sites at the Hurlers um, 
in relationship to how they fit into the wider landscape around them as well on Bodmin Moor. So after I've spoken about the hurlers, I'm going to move on to some sites, uh, mostly actually in West Cornwall, I think, but there's also a couple of sites um, on the hurlers as well, which are, 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 are on Bodmin Moor around the hurlers as well, which I'll, I will also add into the mix at the end as well. So hopefully it will give you a real flavour of um, the types of things that I do and the types of examples that we have in Cornwall of sites and the possibilities of how they are linked to the sky and um, maybe some insights into what the ancient people were thinking about as they were laying out these sites as well um, because we have no written records from those times so we can only glean into these things by um, going out and looking and um, considering the way that they set out these locations and things. Wonderful, excellent. Look, we've got a couple more, couple more comments. Jen, hi, Carolyn. Hi, <laughs> hi there. John, <laughs> hi, Carolyn and Harry. Harry. Hi, John. Hi. Thank you for being here. It's wonderful to have you here, folks. Ingrid, fascinating, great stuff. Thank you, Ingrid. Cool. Okay. Um, We've, Carolyn has, has, has kindly prepared a, a, a PowerPoint presentation. So, um, Carolyn, just um, tell me when you'd like yeah, to start. I, I, and... I, yeah, I, I wanted to prepare some slides because I, I realised that not everyone has been um, to the hurlers. They probably, some people, it, from the looks of things, are, are much further afield and probably haven't even been to Cornwall. So, um, I've brought some slides along. Um, they are mostly photographs, so it's just to give you a, a real idea of the type of um, site that it is and um, hopefully give you a, a, a bit more of an idea of the location around and the types of monuments that we have here in Cornwall. Um, so sh shall, shall we start sharing the slides, Harry? Is that Indeed. a good idea? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, here we are. Okay. so. Um, this is just the introductory slide, but straight away you can see that the hurlers are a stone circle site and um, that is where they're located. So in the bottom left, you can see where Cornwall is. We're that um, far southwest tip of England um, and the hurlers themselves are located in a granite area called Bodmin Moor. So this is a, a landscape which is um, quite hilly. It's quite exposed, um, moorland with uh, lots of different sight lines with different hills and outcrops and things. Um, the plan itself shows you, which I've, I've circled there, you can see there's some mini little circles within that. Those are the hurlers themselves. This is a, it is a triple stone circle site. So in that way, it is pretty unique, um, not just for Cornwall, but for the UK. Um, there are, I, I only know of one other possibi possibility of a, a triple stone circle site and that's Formborough up in Yorkshire. There is a suggestion that there is another one um, down at Tregger Seal, but that's um, a little bit more ambiguous as to whether that is actually a triple and it's most likely a, just a double stone circle site. So um, I probably should rewind out of that and say what a stone circle site is. Um, stone circles are um, a collection of uh, stones which have been put it, it spaced out in, in a circular um, or nearly circular um, situation. Um, the hurlers themselves, as I say, is free of these circles of stones uh, which are all made from granite at the hurlers, so that, that is the local moor stone, although some of the stones may, if you listen to Jackie's talk last week, may have come from different locations on the moor, um, not just in the immediate area, but some of them have been brought in from locations a little bit further afield on, on the moorland itself. And they've been brought to this location um, and they've been positioned in these circular representations. We, we don't know really why they, would, why they were laying them out that way, but there is um, nearly a thousand stone circles in the UK and Ireland. So it's, it's not something which is just found within Cornwall, um, although, as I say, for, for three of these stone circles to be in, in, in location very close to each other makes it quite, quite a unique site. Um, okay, Harry, if you want to just 
flick back to the next one, please. Um, okay, so here we are. This is uh, an aerial shot of the stone circles. Um, you can see the, the, the bottom stone circle is actually under the wording. Then you've got quite a distinctive middle stone circle and then an upper one above that. They are laid out in a row, um, quite close to each other. And uh, the landscape itself is uh, quite significant. Um, it's got this Stowe's Hill, which is this large rocky outcrop um, on its northern skyline. And then there is something called Rillerton Barrow, which is a large mound. And I'll, I'll return to Rillerton Barrow in a bit, but I, I, I want to talk a little bit more about Stowe's Hill. So if we, if we just flick on to the next one, um, Harry. Mm -hmm. Right. So Stowe's Hill is, um, in, in the local area, is, is quite well known for having these um, very unusual natural features on the top. Um, one of them there is shown in the bottom right picture. It's called the cheese ring. And these natural features seem to have interested um, the, the people from this period who, who built um, the stone circle and also probably the people that lived in the area prior to that, so the Neolithic people as well. And the Neolithic people, they um, created this ring of stones, um, this embanked um, collection of, of stones around that, encircling some of these natural features. And it's called Stowe's Pound. And beyond that, they actually had, on, on the ridge of the hilltop, they actually had their own huts and everything um, up up on that top of that hill hill itself. So they were living up there, but they also had this Stowe Pound, which is um, kind, kind of a, a, a unique feature for that location as well. There are other some some of these pounds um, in and around Cornwall, but they're quite unique to the to the southwest of Britain. Um, it shows that it was an important site to them because they went to a, a huge amount of effort. To, to, to create this pound. Um, I've tried to show it in, in the top right image, but I don't know if it's coming up very clear. It's, it's this large circular area of, of, of stones. And if you climb up there at the moment, um, you would still find the pound and you have to climb over the pound wall in, into this area where these uh, strange natural features are. So, so they were obviously of interest to, to these people that were already living on, on this landscape. Uh, before the stone circles themselves were built. The, the hill later on went to have some quarry work um, occurring. And that is, it. you can see that the hill itself actually has a cliff face. That's the quarry. So we don't really know um, the full profile of the hill itself. But from the hurlers, um, the image to the left is, is photographed from the hurlers itself. You can see that the profile of, of the cheese ring and these um, strange natural features are, are, are very distinctive. Uh, and that is directly north of the hurlers. So they've already thought about locating the hurlers themselves on, uh, on the hillside with these features directly north of them. So they've got this large um, northerly hill and these features are directly cardinally positioned north of them, um, which is interesting to start with. And um, if we carry on, Harry, we'll have a look at the next one. Mm -hmm. Also um, surrounding the, the hurlers are these um, other features. Uh, so we have another large hill called Carazin Hill. And um, that photograph there is taken from the middle, the central circle. So as I say, there are three circles. And this, um, this I'm stood in the central circle to take that one. It's um, the, the bottom left image with the two radio towers on. Carradon Hill has a large amount of uh, from say burial mounds on it, so um, mounds that were probably put there about three and a half to four thousand years ago within within the early Bronze Age. Um, and it seems to be um, almost a, 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 a site, a, a funerary site where they, they've interred their dead just, just above um, the, the circles themselves. So it's, it's interesting in itself that it, it's um, very localized to the site. And you can see a lot of these um, burial mounds across the ridge of that flat ridged hill um, as, as you are in the hurlers. 
Um, the one above is Kit Hill. So um, to, just slightly to the north or to the left, as we would look at that photograph, is um, a distant hill called Kit Hill. It's been framed by Carradon Hill and by the actual ridge of, of the hurler site next to it. Um, the, the hurlers themselves start uh, at quite a low position on, on a slope and you gradually, as you would walk through the free circles, you're increasing in, in altitude. It's, it's quite a low, uh, a low rise, but the hill itself keeps rising until you get to another ridge and then you, you carry on to Stowe Pound in the north. Um, to the west of it, um, there is a, a, another ridgeway and on that ridgeway is quite a significant cairn um, which can be seen to, directly to the west of the southern circle. Um, so um, I should say Kit Hill is directly east of the um, central circle. So once again, we've got um, positions that seem to be being marked cardinally from, from these circles themselves. So th these ideas have been known about for quite a while. So uh, the first sort of interpretation um, astronomically of these sites was done by uh, a, an astronomer called Sir Norman Lockyer. He was a Victorian astronomer that visited the hurlers at the turn of the century. And he made interpretations around the site. He, he was interested in uh, particularly where um, Stoke Pound was in relation to, to the circles, but also to Rillerton Barrow and links to um, the motion of the sun as well as the stars. And um, he made these original interpretations. Now, a number of these have been um, have gone out of favor. But I, whenever I visit a site, I always like to have a look at the historic interpretations of the site and, and see if there's any um, relevance within these and um, how they, they um, went about making these measurements and whether they set about it in, in a scientific way and whether um, there was a way, any way that I can improve it or any alternative explanation that maybe I could bring um, with my knowledge of sites and, and other sites in the area as well. But um, so Norman Lockyer had already um, worked out that um, the Hurler site had this interesting position on the hillside where so Pound was um, to the north, this Kit Hill to the east, and this western burial mound um, over to the west, west of the site. And he'd also looked at Carradon Hill and where the winter solstice um, sunrise had, had come out of um, Carradon Hill from one of these barrows. Now, uh, another um, researcher, uh, O'Brien, came along in the 1980s and he published a book about um, stone circle sites on Bodmin Moor. And his work on the hurlers was very interesting. He'd uh, positioned himself within the circles and he looked at all the barrows along Carradon Hill. And then he looked at the timing of the sun um, as it approached winter solstice. So here, here in the Northern Hemisphere, where we are in the UK, um, at equinox, the sun, um, so at this position uh, where the sun would um, be on the March the 21st, 22nd, and then again, September the 21st, 22nd, what we, we term equinox, um, it, it would be rising directly in the east and setting directly in the west which is interesting for those positions of Kit Hill and the Western Khan. But as, we sit, as the sun sinks further south towards the winter solstice, um, it would be sinking across the ridge of Carradon Hill, the rising position of that sun until it reached its most southerly rising position, which would actually be towards the bottom um, right of that ridge. Um, and that would be its winter solstice rising position. So O'Brien had done a lot of work about position of himself within the three circles, because you've got to think you could either stand in the bottom circle, the middle or the top circle, and what that did in relationship to um, those rising sun positions over Carradon Hill. And he, he had a feeling that um, Carradon Hill was acting as some sort of countdown at the positions of the barrows to the winter solstice, which is a, an interesting proposition. Um, okay, so let's carry on to the next Fine, Before we move on, Carolyn, okay. may I bring in a couple of comments? Ingrid, it looks yep. like a cairn, 
And this was in relation to an earlier slide. I believe it was in relation to the, um, the cheese ring, the bottom uh, right image. Okay. Uh, so the cheese ring is a completely natural feature. Um, it's it's uh, really quite unusual. It's um, I probably should have put one up with someone stood next to it. So um, that bottom stone, you probably someone's head would only reach that bottom stone where that first lip, where that. So it's, it's quite a large feature. It's significant. Um, I'm not a geologist, so I can't tell you how they formed, but it, it's certainly uh, not a man-made um, collection of stones which someone has piled on top of each other. Um, yeah, they were actually... It would be nice if it was. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They were actually made through a process of erosion over, over literally millions, millions right. of years. The granite is about um, 500 million years old, um, 300 million to 500 million years old. It's um, magma. That, uh, that then was eroded over, o o over that time. And then we have another, another question here, or a comment rather, and then we'll move on. There's another triple stone circle at Stan and Drew in Somerset. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I believe there is, but I, I, I also think that there is some uh, questions over that one, if I, I remember rightly. I would have to recheck that one though. Interesting. Yeah. That, I think that I think that's yeah. another another talk, another conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Let me. Let, sorry for interrupting. There. Let me move on to the next that's slide. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. So um, Jackie did uh, last week's talk. If if you revisit that, she she um, explained that we're around the hurlers. They're not just situated alone in this landscape. There's there's lots of other monuments around them. Um, within the same sort of landscape that you can see, but also within the adjacent landscapes next to the hurlers, there's a whole other landscape called uh, um, Craddock Moor, uh, which has a stone circle and some stone rows and things like that, which are within easy walking distance. But the, these are two, two of the more localized um, monuments. So there's uh, double standing stones called the Pipers, and they are off to uh, the eastern side of the stone circles, um, it, just kind of east of that southern circle itself. And then at the top of um, the route, if you were going to walk from the bottom of the hill and come through the most southern circle, the central, and then the upper circle, and keep carrying on on a straight line up to the top of the hill, you would reach this significant burial mound called Rillerton Barrow. Um, this was opened up in the early 1800s and they found um, a burial within there along with this golden cup called the Rillerton Cup. Um, so it, it seems to be um, a really significant mound. Um, it's not had a, a full excavation. There's possibly more things in there, we don't know. But it certainly, um, when, when you step back, it, it dominates the, that northern skyline along with, with um, Stowe Pound itself. And uh, it is at the end of this processional route. If you carry on in a straight line from from through the circles, you would reach Rillerton Barrow. Okay, if if you want to carry on, Harry, and mm -hmm. that's the next one. And um, so here we have uh, the three circles: uh, the the bottom one, uh, the central, and the upper one on the right hand side. And as you can see between the middle and the upper one, there's something that says quartz pavement. And on the left-hand side, there's an image of um, a, a feature um, which has been called a pavement, but um, as, as Jackie explained, it's, it's very difficult to call, call it a pavement because it's a collection of stones that are embedded in the ground. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. But it's this um, very linear um, feature which has been discovered um, between the, the central and the upper circle. Um, so we have this route through the three circles leading to this significant barrow with, with this feature um, between these two upper stone circles. Uh, the feature itself doesn't extend fully between those, although it's, it's shown on the plan that it does. It, there is actually a gap at either end before you reach a stone at either end. Um, and you can see that um, just about in, in that left hand picture, there is a, a stone at the end of that line of, um, of um, 
paving stones, if, if we're going to call them paving stones. If you want to flip onto the next one, because it probably gives a bit more. Um, so, so these were pictures from um, a more recent excavation um, in 2013, which Jackie led. And um, you get an idea of the sizing here, because there's actually people stood next to it. That first picture, I always think it makes the pavement look quite short, and it's, it's quite a long um, size. It's, it's quite a, a, a long length between these two circles with, with these stones positioned. And as you can see, they are positioned in a long line, but they are very neat uh, on the edges. And they are um, got different features within that. So one in particular is this uh, large protruding stone, which is about halfway down. Um, which is the picture on the right hand side, which um, Jackie um, termed the pyramid stone. Now this is um, a, a piece of blue, bluey whitish quartz. And it, it, now even though the whole pavement has been recovered under turf, this one actually sticks out and um, it's a bit of a trip hazard. Um, it's because it's quite protruding. But I wanted to show you also that picture on the right because you get an idea that these stones were, were um, not uniformly flat at the surface. Um, they, they protrude out uh, to all different levels. And with the blocking of, of the pavement at either end by one of the stone circle stones, it, it seems to be that this pavement was never made to be walked on. So that's why there is, it's, it's kind of strange to call it a pavement. So anyone who was moving through the circle, so if people were going to move in a processional way through through the freestone circles and up the hill to Rillerton Barrow, they would reach this feature. They would um, possibly, well, they would have have to, have to go round um, one of the standing stone circle, uh, one of the stones in the, the middle circle, and then they would have to walk alongside this feature before um, entering the most um, the, the northern circle at the top. Um, and then carrying on their way, if that's what they were so doing, up to, to Rillerton Barrow. And that axis of the site really interested me. Um, did that axis of the site relate to anything um, that, that would have been happening within the sky itself? And I started to research that along with another astronomer called um, Brian Sheen. And um, we certainly revisited some of the earlier interpretations of that axis of the site. Um, particularly Lockyer had, had made interpretations about the way that the site was laid out. But we, we revisited that um, and then we, we had a look and came up with some of our own ideas about, about it as well, which I'll go into now. So if you want to just flick on Harry. Oh, I, I should really say as well, um, one of the difficulties for me, um, and this is some of the finds from the site itself, um, some of the flints that were found during the excavations, is that the site itself has quite an extensive timeline. And, and when you are considering things um, astronomically, um, particularly with stellar um, ideas and ideas about stars, the, the motion of, of the Earth through, through the heavens, um, it comes under an effect called precession. So we're, we're virtually on it. We're, we are on a kind of, it's almost like a spinning top is the best way to explain it. And the, what our north, what, where our north celestial pole is in, in the sky changes over a, a cycle of 26,000 years. So if we were to go outside now and um, we were to look at our uh, North Celestial Pole, or let's say we would stood on the North Pole and looked directly above us, we would see a star called Polaris. We're not on the North Pole here in England, we're at, at, at a latitude of 50 degrees, so at a latitude of 50 degrees in the North we would find Polaris. And um, But if we rewind into um, history, that, that star has moved, so, and it happens quicker than people realize. So if, if we were to look at, at a site in um, about 2000 BC, where the stars would be a few hundred years later would be somewhere completely different. So they would have moved off to one side um, because of this effect of procession. So we have to have a, a general idea of, of a timeline or we have to look at, um, consider different dates 
for the site and see what happens, particularly if we're, we're looking at, at um, stellar ideas. Okay, Harry, if you want to carry on. Cool. There's a comment I'd like to bring in just yeah. for a minute yeah. um, from Jackie, Jackie Nowakowski. Hi there. That's a very important point. The pavement is very lumpy as a surface and the projecting pyramid stone make it, makes it less, function, less of a functional practical surface and more of a conceptual feature. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, it, it, as I say, it wasn't some, somewhere for people to push a cart along or <laughs> walk along. It was almost like they were bringing... Um, and uh, another thing about that pavement is all, all the different um, stones. Uh, they, there were different types of stones and um, they, they could have been bringing a stone to represent something and adding it to the pavement over time so it, um, we, d we don't understand fully what they were doing um, we can only surmise from our own ideas and concepts about things in life but um, the, it's certainly a nice idea that people might have found a stone to represent maybe one of their ancestors or maybe to represent something that was important to them and then brought it and added it to the pavement and it was um, a communal um, job that they all um, got involved with but yeah, definitely a conceptual idea on the, of their, of you know, of, of their time. Okay, Absolutely. Harry, if you want to. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Yes. So, so when I came on the site, the the problem with the site itself is that it's exceptionally complex. Um, it's hard enough interpreting a single stone circle site, but when you've got three, you've got to decide where you're going to take measurements from. And you've got to, because um, otherwise you're going to end up with so many measurements that you, you're obviously going to find alignments and things, but what, what alignments are, are of any value. So the first thing I did when I, I went out to the site was I chose um, a number of locations where I would make measurements from and also a, a number of ideas uh, about those locations. So. Um, a, B, C are the axis of, of, of those three circles. There is a slight twist in, in the layout of, um, there's a slight um, juncture between uh, C to B and B to A, but it, it's, it's not very much. I, I was also interested in um, B because it has um, a, a, a small, what is a small stone now within the center of the circle, or it's slightly off to one side as you can see, but I'll call it a central stone. Um, this was at one point was a, a lot larger and it's, as it's been repositioned, I think it, um, it possibly broken off um, a small amount of it, but it would have been a more significant stone um, in the original layout. And I was interested in B, ma making that measurement from that stone in B towards that eastern Kit Hill and um, seeing if it was on, on the eastern horizon and whether it did um, link to the equinox it, itself, or that midpoint sun between those two solstice points. Uh, D, off to one side are the two pipers. I was interested in their layout and whether there was any astronomical interpretation that I could uh, bring um, to, to the positioning of the pipers. So that's those two standing stones off to one side. Um, so that's why I, uh, uh, that's um, the, the main body of research that I undertook at the Hurlers. Uh, from the positioning of them. Um, okay, Harry, if you click on. Mm -hmm. So um, I won't keep you too long on this slide because I know it's not the most interesting slide, but um, this is just to show you the issue really um, with looking at stellar alignment. So um, I've got my positions there and the directions that I'm looking and um, a number of stars by name um, are found in that match those alignments. But if, if you look, so the first one, Vega, it, it only aligned in 2500 BC. By 2000 BC, it moved off to one side and by uh, and before in 3000 BC, it wasn't in the alignment position. And this is the problem with not having um, dating, which um, can narrow down um, stellar alignments. Um, the, same, the same with Arcturus, which was um, the, the D to the northern horizon. This is the one that uh, Norman Lockyer was particularly interested in. 
but it, it only aligned really in and around 2000 BC and, and slightly after that as well. Um, there were some other stars um, which, which didn't move so much. So um, the one looking over the, um, this middle stone in, in, in um, the middle circle uh, towards Pitt Hill, there was a star there that didn't move so much because of precession, because of the way precession works. And, and um, as, as you get down to that eastern horizon, stars don't move so much. But it seemed more likely that that would be um, an alignment with the sun rather than with a, a fairly dim star, because that's not even a particularly interesting star itself. It, it's, it's, uh, it's got a magnitude of about um, 1.2, 1.3. But it, it would it seems more more significant that, that, that a solar alignment would be uh, more relevant in, in that position anyway. So I, I just kind of discounted the stellar alignments that they're not completely discounted because there might be a point in time where we've got um, dating, which is a narrower for, for the site. And then we can revisit those those alignments and have a look at them again, and see if, if any of them are uh, 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 possibilities as to why they laid out the site as, as they have. Okay, Harry. So um, this is where we start to get a little bit different and um, different ideas coming in. Um, the pavement itself um, was a fascinating find. And um, if, if you go back to Jackie's talk, she'll tell you all about the um, the archive that she discovered of, with the old photographs and everything, but um, it was so it was opened up in again in 2013 for this um, archaeological dig, but then it's been recovered on the, back under the turf again. Um, what I wanted to do here with uh, a, a, a colleague Brian Sheen was to have a look at. Um, how the pavement would have, have, have appeared under different lighting conditions. And we called this the yellow cloth experiment um, because we couldn't dig the pavement back up. So we came out with a, a length of yellow cloth, as you can see from the drone. Now, you might ask, why have they come with yellow cloth when um, the pavement itself looked um, like it was all different bits of stone, bits of gray and blues and yellows and, and, and quartzy bits? But quite a lot of the stones themselves seem to have been embedded in um, a kind of a yellow, gray, silty clay, um, which is from the local landscape. And if, if you've wandered around and it's quite wet and you go into kind of some of the more river beddy areas, I, I know this yellow clay is, um, is uh, stains quite, <laughs> quite dramatically because I've, I've lost a, a pair of boots to this yellow clay I did, which were kind of stained nicely yellow. So. You can understand perhaps why they might have packed this yellow clay around the stones themselves um, as well to keep the stones maybe in position and things. Um, so we brought out this length of cloth and um, Harry, if you want to click on. Um, uh, we decided to test it on, on a night where uh, there would be a full moon. Um, it had to be a reasonably uh, clear night. Um, this idea of how, how, how much it, it it, doing a, an experiment like this is, is uh, a, you're never going to fully uh, be able to represent what it was like at the time, but it, this is kind of the next best thing to see whether um, there was any traction in it at all. So we came along, as I say, on a night of a full moon. Um, we, we waited till the sunset. We had different times. So as the sunset, we go into different periods of twilight. Uh, where there's different levels of lighting and we would um, decided uh, before we came out when we would photograph this um, piece of yellow cloth from a drone and see if we could see um, the yellow cloth at all, um, whether we felt that um, maybe the pavement um, would have been uh, appeared under low lighting conditions and wh whether that might have been of interest to them. So if we click on. so. Um, these were the results. Um, you can see at the top one, uh, we're early on. I think the sun had set at that point, and it's still quite light. Uh, the one to the top right, that's um, certainly during twilight. So we've got a nice red sky in the background. The sun is, what is way below the horizon. And then the bottom one, you might just be able to see uh, the yellow cloth still just on the black background. 
and and that was under the full moon itself. So th there is a possibility that they were using um, or that they were interested in these um, stones within this uh, within the pavement itself as as something that might um, be visible at night to them or more visible than the surrounding uh, standing stones themselves, which um, disappeared completely into the background. Um, if you click on Harry. Um, so this was just really a conclusion slide um, about what we were doing and um, saying that we were really just checking out this pavement under different lighting conditions. And we felt that there was more visibility of the pavement than the surrounding features under these low lighting conditions. Um, as I say, it's, it's very difficult to uh, recreate what would have been happening at, at that time, but this was our best attempt to do that and to see if there was anything of interest going on. Um, okay, Harry, if you want to. So, um, one of the things that we noticed when we looked at the um, axis of the site is the axis of the site goes from this north, north, east, south, south, west, or if you're coming on the site and walking up the hill, you'd come from the south, south, west to the north, north, east. Um, the axis of the site is too far uh, north and south for it to be a rising or setting position for the sun or the moon. Um, and as you can see, we looked at um, stellar um, objects and um, Vega was the one that um, aligned, but Vega was only going to be aligning at a very specific point. So then we started to look um, at the Milky Way itself. And um, in particular, we were looking at the Milky Way because uh, someone made the comment that the pavement itself almost represented the Milky Way. Um, it had a spatial relationship to the Milky Way with these different colored pieces of rock. And um, the part of the pavement where it actually um, starts to split out and, um, and then it, it, it it dissipates um, off to two, two different sides, which someone said almost looked like the Cygnus um, rift happening in the Milky Way. So it, it, it might seem a little bit of a stretch, but there is uh, this idea that the pavement could have been representing something in the night sky. Um, and we already knew that these, this pavement was um, more visible under low light conditions. So we started to have a look where the Milky Way was at certain times of the year and its rising and setting points. Um, the Milky Way itself is very seasonal. So it does extend um, all the way up to that northern horizon and it will arch all the way over. But at certain points of the year, it lies flat. So um, it's very visible during um, initially in the evenings during the summer and the winter, but in the autumn and the springtime, it's more flat against the horizon when it rises. So we're actually, um, as astronomers, um, if you want to photograph for um, the Milky Way, the best time to do it would be summer or winter, particularly summer when we're looking directly into the center of the Milky Way, Sagittarius and things like that. Um, the autumn and the spring are, are great times when we're actually looking above and below the Milky Way itself. We're actually looking out above and below the arms of the Milky Way out to um, further galaxies outside our own. And that's when you see astronomers going out and they're photographing like the Leo triplet and things like that. So these, these far away galaxies. But what was interesting to me about the position of this Milky Way is there was a time when the Milky Way itself uh, rose out of Rillerton Barrow, and it, it laid almost flat along the horizon all the way round and down to that southern um, aspect of the site. And the Milky Way itself um, has a, a lot of mythology attached to it um, throughout um, different cultures around the world, historic cultures and more modern cultures. So um, Certainly, historically in Ireland, it's been known as um, a river, um, a river in the sky to match the River Boyne, where you've got the Newgrange and Nauvan Dow, these massive 
um, burial mounds uh, situated along the Boyne, and, and they think that the Milky Way is, is a reflection of that in the sky, of that, that, um, that very um, significant river within, uh, spiritual river within their culture. Um, the Navajo Indians see it as a pathway to the dead, um, and, and many other cultures are seeing it either as a river in the sky or a pathway in the sky. Um, uh, quite a number of them see it as a pathway leading to another place where your ancestors are. Um, it's a pathway to move through into another, into another life. So we've got all of these different cultures coming with similar types of ideas about this feature in the night sky. And um, one thing I should also say about the Milky Way is that we've, in many locations, have lost the ability to see the Milky Way. It is the largest feature in the, in the night sky, um, particularly if you go to dark sky sites. Um, it's incredibly impressive. And um, it's, it's something that we, in modern cultures, with, um, without the dark sky locations that we once had, have lost the ability to appreciate um, to its full glory. So, um, and it, we've had this disconnect from these ideas around what the Milky Way represents to people because of that. Um, so as I say, so we rewind back to the hurlers. Uh, we've got this um, idea of the Milky Way um, emerging from Rillerton Barrow at the top of the hill, extending along the horizon all the way down. It's the eastern horizon, past Kit Hill, past Carradon, all the way down to the southern end of the site. Um, it's doing that seasonally. As the night progresses, the Milky Way would start to arch up and over, it, uh, over above and over the heads of people above them. Um, if you want to click on Harry and, oops, there we go. So here we go. I've got a representation. This is a computer representation of what it would look like. So um, what's happening um, is a, there is a possibility that there is a meeting of pathways. Um, there's this pathway on the ground um, where people are processing through these stone circles up to Rillerton Barrow, possibly, and there is this pathway in the sky um, meeting, uh, meeting the ground at that point in, in time. And it's happening during this springtime evening um, in and around this period where the, you've got this um, equinox or midpoint sun, sunrise coming out of Kit. Hill. So this midpoint between the two solstices, so in and around the March the 21st, 22nd. Um, it's, it's a nice idea, and um, I don't think we'll ever know if that's what they were thinking, but there is, um, this is the idea that um, I, I think sits really well with the hurlers. As I say, it's, it's at such a complex site with, with all these different ideas going on, but this is one thing that fits over the idea that there's this pathway on the ground. There's also this um, idea of them being there um, around the equinox point because of this connection with um, Kit Hill from the central circle. And there's this pathway in the sky which connects this um, significant barrow all the way along the, the side of this eastern side, all the way down to the bottom of the hill, which is where they would have started to process along. OK, Harry, if you click on. Mm -hmm. um, so, just this is just really the final um, part of it, which was this equinox position. Um, uh, as I say, we, we call it equinox, but they wouldn't have known it as the equinox. They would have just known it as, as a mid position between the two solstices. Um, they've got this framing of this Kit Hill um, in the distance, and we've got this midpoint sun, um, sunrise coming from that position. Um, it's not exactly accurate. Um, it's about two days out. Um, there are a lot of other stone circles on Bodmin Moor which have suggested um, alignments at um, that March and September the 21st, 22nd. Um, certainly the two Laskernic uh, are um, the setting sun with uh, Brown Willie. Um, you've got Fernacre with the rising sun out of the large can on the top of Brown Willie, and you've got um, a, one at Godeva as well. So there's all these other circles on Bodmin Moor with a similar thing going on with this midpoint sun and a significant hill in the distance. Um, so they're, they're also adding weight to, to this idea of, of this 
time um, during their, their, the annual calendar being important to these people. Okay, Harry. Um, so, as I say, uh, there is, uh, there's probably more that I could have added in here, but I, I realise I'm going to get short time fairly soon. Um, and I've got other sites that I just wanted to run through with you guys as well. But um, the Hurlers is an incredibly complex site. So my work is only touched on part of um, possibly what could be happening there. I know um, lots of people are possibly going to ask about Orion and the possibility of the three um, circles um, being a representation of, of Orion's belt, which uh, regularly comes up as well. I, I did look at that, and um, the, the the three circles do almost look like a representation of Orion's belt on the ground, but there was no other alignments to Orion that I could find at the site. So unlike the pavement and this alignment of the Milky Way, where they worked in unison, I, I all I had was a spatial look of, of the three circles looking like Orion. Um, I think I've gone through most of that other than the bottom one, which is the men here, which was discovered uh, by Jackie and her team uh, at a later dig in 2016, which is a little way up the hill, um, ha does have a summer solstice alignment. So, um, and that's with uh, Brown Willie, which is our uh, biggest hill here in Cornwall. Um, and if you are stood at that men here, it's the first time that you will see this significant distant, very distant hill at this point um, on the on the horizon, it will suddenly appear. And that is in the, uh, if you were to stand there on the summer solstice, you would see the sunset over that distant hill. So um, it's an interesting position for this single standing stone on the hillside. It's not just randomly been placed somewhere. It's most likely been placed to mark that position of the first time you see Brown Willie, but also um, if you were to go there on the summer solstice, it would have this um, summer solstice sunset over that distant hill. Okay. Right. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or anything, Harry, or do you just want mm, me to carry on? There are a on? few, actually, yes. Um, okay. <laughs> um, when you were talking about the pavement, um, Ingrid wrote... Maybe it was meant to be seen from the stars above. Do you remember the uh, pavement? So maybe, well, what, 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 what's your take on that? Uh, I, I'm not quite sure I understand what Ingrid's asking. So the pavement was meant to be seen from the stars above? Or the yeah, the pavement and, the, and, 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 and with, with the pyramid stone. The, w the way that I read that 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 comment ah, question. Oh, okay. So, okay, P uh, they they were thinking that this that the um, the stars themselves maybe were embodiments of people of the past, and that they would be looking down and to see the pavement. Is is that what Ingrid's meaning? Yes, I think it's something along those lines. I interpret it also yeah. in terms of it's, have, it's, having some. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a possibility. Um, yeah, as I say, these things are, uh, are very difficult to interpret. Yes, absolutely. I, th I, th I, th I wondered if it, if it wouldn't be some sort of dialogue in terms of an offering, in terms of a, here, Possibly. this is what we're doing, a dialogue with the, with, with the ancestors, with, 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 the, the, with, with no the dead, with the spirit life. Yeah. Um, in in, in so, such a way, so look look what we're doing to honour you. You know, give us a good yeah. crop, please. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no practical reason for that pavement to be there. So it's 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 something that is on um, you know unless we can think of a, a, you know down the line a practical reason, but there there is no um, reason for it to be there practically unless it it's it had to have meaning for them in in some way. Um, but yeah, exactly. Um, I'll carry we on. Can with... only surmise. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I'll, I'll let you carry on, and then I'll, I'll retake some of the comments and questions um, after. Okay. So um, I'm I'm going to bring you a little bit west here. So this this is picture was taken at Trader Seal. If we drop onto the next uh, slide as well. So I, I could probably do a whole talk on Trader Seal. It's it's become a little bit of an obsession of mine uh, for a landscape. <laughs> it's it's. Um, in many ways, it's very similar to the Hurlers. Um, the, it's a double stone circle site. 
Um, it has a significant hill. Um, so on the top right hand side, you can see there's quite a significant hill on that top right photo towards the left there, uh, a rocky outcrop. Um, that was taken on summer solstice sunrise, that top right picture, the summer solstice sunrise uh, from one of the stone circles there um, is over um, a couple of barrows which have been built on the line of the summer solstice sunrise. The top left show uh, a Salonian style entrance grave which um, has a passageway uh, within that the passageway is aligned to the winter solstice sunrise. Um, the bottom left is a picture at the stone circle and um, the stone circle itself is, has been uh, built with a, a V in the landscape, um, a, a, a kind of a, a, a valley leading down to the sea and it's the only part of the sea that you can see from, from the stone circle site so it's almost in a bowl, a bit, bit like the hurlers himself is um, slightly not, not so um, uh, elevated but um, there's this small amount of sea that you can see and on, on that sea uh, is framed some distant islands called the Isles of Scilly and the winter solstice sunset drops onto the Isles of Scilly themselves um, and then there's these um, enigmatic hold stones very local to, to the stone circles themselves uh, which I'm going to come back to in a moment because I, I think um, they, they deserve a little bit more of an explanation as to what I think is going on there. Um, okay, Harry, if you drop over. But yeah, the Treasure Seal is an amazing site. So, oh, okay, I've, I've put the Holdstone slide next. So we, we get lots of Holdstones all, all around Cornwall. Probably the, the ones uh, that people really know about is the Men and Toll, which is a big donut shaped Holdstone, uh, which people climb through. Um, as uh, a ritual thing, um, they pass babies through to cure them of diseases and there's all different ideas um, set in folklore around the men and toll and there is about a, a number of these hold stones as well. So the ones on the Traeger Seal landscape are a stone row, um, there are four in a row and one uh, outlier, a smaller one off to one side and um, they're unfortunately not probably not in the exact position that they would have been originally. They've fallen over um, a, a few times from what I can tell and then being put back up. Um, but the holes themselves interest me um, and, um, and it's a way that um, they could have been used um, for people to um, look at the sun coming through the holes. So I, I'm not really into people laying down and, and looking through a hole directly at the sun. But if you were to look at the shadow behind the stone and, um, and if you were to um, get the sunrise on a certain day or a certain a few days in a row and the sun shines through the hole, it would make a beam of light onto the shadow behind. And as we have a number of these hold stones in a row, um, they're all slightly orientated slightly differently. Um, the possibility is, uh, and they are all orientated to uh, a, a south eastern horizon um, leading down towards um, a winter solstice sun. So, so there is an idea that maybe that they were positioned as a countdown calendar to the winter solstice which would tie in with these other winter solstice ideas around Tregosil itself with the winter solstice sunset going over the Isles of Scilly and the passage grave being aligned to the winter solstice. Um, it's, it's a site which really fascinates me anyway so as I say I could probably go on and on about that one but um, the other hold stone there is um, a much older monument so this is a Neolithic monument called Trevithy Coit back over Bodmin Moor way we are so this is a, um, a really massive uh, stone monument and it's got this large uh, uh, capstone on the top and within that capstone um, they've created this hole um, I don't know if you can see, but there's a shadow on the ground with this beam of light coming in this um, circular beam of, of, of the hole um, shining through. Um, to get it to do that, I was there on the summer solstice at about uh, 20 past one um, on our time. Now, if, if we were to take into account that we're on British summertime, and, and that would take it back to 20 past 12, and then to take into account 
that we are um, 20 degrees, uh, five degrees west of Greenwich. So we've got that uh, different longitude, uh, which equates to about 20 minutes of time. Um, so we are looking at the sun at, as it reaches its most highest position in the sky. And what, it, what it's doing as it reaches its most highest position in the sky is it's actually shining through that hole and making a beam of light onto the ground below. Now, whether that was their intention or whether um, that, that big capstone has split or moved, um, the sun has also slightly moved, um, but not a huge amount um, to make much of a difference between that, that um, highest position in the sky on the summer solstice. But, it, but it's an interesting thing. As I say, hole, holes intrigue me on, on, stone, uh, on these ancient sites. So, um, I don't know if this is how they were using them. Maybe, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But um, I, I'm enjoying exploring these ideas as I go out and about. Anyway, Harry, if you want to click on. Um, OK, so, so this is an interesting site. This is uh, a place called Little Galva. Um, it's um, a collection of stones which have been um, placed, uh, positioned um, to frame a dif distant hill. So you can see the ridgeway there of the hillside in, in the distance. And um, what happens on the equinox, so once again, we're talking that, that midpoint sum between the two solstices um, when it's uh, rising and setting east, east to west, is um, the sun is actually, um, originally when I went down, I thought it was going to set into the dip on the ridge and just disappear. But what it actually does is it rolls down the ridge of, of this hill. And it rolls for about 14 minutes, the, the sunset. Um, and um, it, it, it was just quite astounding to go and watch that. And that's something that anyone can go and watch. It, it, it happens every equinox, as long as it's not cloudy. It's, um, it's quite a tricky site to get to. But once you're up there and you have a look through this gap, you can watch this rolling sunset down, down the ridge of this um, hill. Once again, another significant hill in the area, this one, Carngalva. So that's the, the hill it's framing, um, and it's got this spiny back. Uh, and it's also in a, quite a, a ritual landscape as well, once again, with the Neolithic tour enclosure at the top, some stone circles nearby, and Bronze Age burial mounds and, and things like that. So it's, it's a landscape which has been used by um, the, uh, quite well by prehistory, and, and there's lots of monuments around it. OK, Harry. Um, this one was uh, more by error than judgment. I was uh, photographing a sunrise. Um, this is the Merry Maidens in West Cornwall. And um, the Merry Maidens has 19 small stones and a gap. Um, I finished uh, photographing the, sun, the sunrise. I went round the other side to photograph myself through the gap. And um, I photographed this. So as you can see, all the stones are leading down and touching on the stones opposite. This was actually on um, in and around the beginning of August, which is a Celtic festival called Luz Nasa. Um, whether that was the intention of the positioning of the stones and the gap, who knows? But it, it made a very interesting photograph, and it's on my wall behind me as well because I, I quite like that one. But that one that one was discovered more by error than judgment. And I've, I've been working with uh, another RPO astronomer called Terence Meaden, who's very interested in shadows and the positions of stones in the stone circles and the way that they, they connect to each other like this via shadow. Um, so these stones aren't very high. Um, they're a three foot in height. So it's amazing how far the shadows extend over the landscape. Um, and this is probably about five, six minutes after sunrise itself. Um, on, on that on that date. Okay, Harry. Okay, and then I just, if you click again, because I, I realise I haven't clicked that one twice. Uh, oh, no, go back, sorry. <laughs> oh, there is meant to be a second pitch on that one, but it's not coming up, don't worry. So mm -hmm. um, this this is actually on the Isles of Scilly, so this is one of the colonial style passageways, and um, I'm putting confirming ideas because this is already known about, but I do like to go out and check these ideas. Um, this is Port Pellet, and it aligns um, with the summer solstice sunset. There we go. So um, I, I actually sent a friend of mine in there because I wasn't over um, the summer solstice a few years back, and they climbed inside and they've watched the sun 
illuminate the chamber as it goes down. Um, and a number of these um, seem to be aligned, but there is some um, some range in, in the way that they're orientated. So not all of them are aligned, these Salonian style passageways. But if you click on Harry, there's a, a couple more. Um, there we go. Um, the, the, the bottom one is Basilic, and the bottom right is Basilic on the winter solstice uh, sunrise, or well, a few days before the winter solstice sunrise. We didn't have the most fantastic run in that year, so I took an opportunity on a morning um, on the run up. As you can see, I'm, I'm probably stood in two feet of water inside the entrance grave itself, but we can see the sun rising through, through the little gap at the end. There, the sun doesn't move its position very much as it as it reaches those solstice points. So you can use a number of days either side to go and test these ideas out. The top left one is uh, Treen, uh, Salonium Passage Bay, the South Treen, and that's summer solstice sunset. Um, the the Passage Bay itself is orientated slightly too far to the north, but you can see that this sun is eking its way round and it would shine into the chamber but not all the way down the chamber itself so whether that was an intentional alignment or just by chance um i, I we don't know um it seems possibly it was more by chance that one because it, it's not bang on like the silica or the poor pellet one which seemed to have been positioned um very um accurately okay harry i think we're about there <laughs> thank you Excellent. Well, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, there's been a few comments and, 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 and questions. Let me just go back a little bit um, further. Comment from Cheryl. Um, there was also a kind of platform or pavement or, uh, of 11 stones on the western side of Trevethy Court in Bodmin Moor, which would have been similarly rough to walk over and this is in respect of the pavement or the pathway which oh. you, which which was recently discovered so this is a feature that 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 that, that is repeated I, I, elsewhere. I think lanyon coit might be similar as well there's this kind of oval platform which lanyon coit positioned on which might be similar but i don't think anyone had a chance to excavate to look but yeah, when they excavated Trevithy, yeah, that's what they discovered. There was this greenstone platform which extended, oval extended out from it. So, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Absolutely. Also from Cheryl, could these platforms, pavements, have been intended to delineate boundaries of the site? It's a possibility. It's a possibility, yeah. to which Jackie replies... Uh, not sure about whether these are boundaries of site or particular place, as surely we are looking at the dynamic at the dynamics over time. So yes, I think that that that, that, that that's important in a way. What 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 is things we can't actually pinpoint them, but we can have a kind of fuzzy idea. So yeah, um, let me see. Um, also from Jackie, interesting that you can see from here how oval the northern circle is, and that you were actually we were actually looking at the aerial photograph of yeah. the hurlers there, and yes, it's the oval becomes it becomes very very obvious from that from from, from above. Um, it's interesting how that view from ground level to bird's eye view gives a it, it gives a dramatic dramatic change. Um, another one from Cheryl, maybe the pathway and processional path to Rillerton Barrow was not intended for human walking, but for the spirits of the dead an uh, ancestors. And yes, again, going back with this, this question point, of yeah. dialogue between the living and the dead, this idea of you know a portal somehow being able to reach out, isn't it? Um, and uh, John makes a comment here. If the circles are on a trading route, or the individual stones could have been brought from afar to add to this significant site, blue quartz, etc. Jackie did mention uh, during her, her presentation that the geology of, 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 of the hurlers 
they'd actually constituted, these stones had been brought from different sites nearby. Um, so yes, that, 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 there is a significance there, although in my opinion, we're not quite sure what it might be, but yeah, there is something there. Um, let me find another one. From Jamie, really recommend watching the equinox sunset from Little Galva. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and Jackie says, incredible at Khan Galva. Yes, I think that the, 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 the photographs, they really denote something. I think what really struck me was two things when you were, when we were, you were presenting those. One was what came to, immediately leapt to my mind was, this is marking time. We're not the only ones obsessed with time, punctuality, and so on. You know, um, these, these these civilizations, these cultures were equally highly, highly focused. Time was was of the essence. They went to a lot of trouble to actually marking these. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was going to they say they certainly were splitting up the calendar, and um, whether I, I don't think they needed to particularly mark um, positions of the calendar to know when where they were within. You know, they'd already got an idea of yes, it's it's almost solstice. They, you know, even I can go outside. I, I'm I'm fairly in tune to where the sun is and things, and think it's almost solstice or it's. It's virtually equinox and things like that, but they they overlaid that with their um, with these ritual ideas of yes, that's important to them, and so that's why they would have been marking it rather than that they needed to to actually be able to tell the date and things. Um, so they weren't creating. I don't think they were creating observatories of of you know in that sense of we, we've got an observatory to to use it to be able to tell what's happening. But we, we want to actually celebrate what's happening, which is a, a different way of looking at it. Exactly. Um, yes, because I think also for us, all this, we're very influenced in our way of thinking, in my opinion, at least by, by rational thinking, you know, the Renaissance and all that, you know. I think, therefore, I am, blah, 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 Descartes and so on. But um, and we make the difference in a secular society between the, 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 the sacred or religious and the profane or scientific, um, certainly our post post Renaissance, whereas these societies wouldn't have had that division between scientific and and and, and religious. It, I, I think these things would have actually merged into one body of knowledge. So the it, what we see as instruments of measuring time were also, as you just mentioned, um, sites. For, for 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 ceremony for worship uh, and and at a complex level there's the ancestors there's the afterlife there's the divine so yeah um, let me see um, beautiful photo of the merry maidens Carolyn yes that was an amazing photograph actually it really really is um, striking as a matter of fact. Um, to which Jackie says, yes, absolutely. Um, John replies, yes, Harry, the big clock in the sky. Yes, indeed, absolutely. It sounds like, uh, sounds like a rock and roll song, Pink Floyd or something. Anyway, <laughs> Jackie, uh, Judith says, I was interested by the two triangles made by the placing of the stones at Little Galva, but would they have moved from the original placing? Um, it's it's an interesting site, Judith, and um, it's there are a number of viewing stations which have I, they're called viewing stations. I, I don't know if that's uh, really the archaeological term, but there's been a number of these sites um, discovered more on Bodmin Moor than, and they tend to be like a gap which you look through and it frames a different a, a, a hillside in the distance. Um, most of them don't seem to have any astronomical significance, but this one at Little Galva does. Um, the size of the rocks are quite large. I would say that they haven't been moved from the time where someone 
has put them in those positions. Um, they certainly, it was identified, I think, by David Giddings um, in, in the 1990s, first of all, as, a, as an archaeological site. And, um, and I, yeah, I, I don't think um, that, that once they were in position, people were particularly moving those stones. But yeah, they are kind of like this triangular um, site that you can actually climb into it and look through it. But it's almost better to stand behind it and watch the event happening through the gap itself, watching the sunset. Um, uh, and it rolled down that car distant Carn Galvers Ridgeway um, by stood outside rather than climbing into the viewing station because um, you don't get the framing of it then. Is that uh, is are you referring to the site that you were you were saying towards the end that you were you're very you're, you're, that's the one that you're researching at the moment. Uh, yeah, well, I've, <laughs> yeah, I've got, um, yeah, so that one, I pretty much know what's going, you know, the timings and everything with that, but yeah, I do need to, I would like to go and witness it a few more times. It's, and, um, and where is it, and timing. what's it called again? It's uh, Little Galva, um, uh, and it's, it, the site, the monument itself doesn't really have a name, um, but it frames Carn Galva, so um, yeah. up, up on the north coast in West Cornwall. Yeah. Yeah, been in, uh, uh, near Zeno sort of way. Yeah. Yeah, between Zeno and Kangalva. That's it. You've got a little ridge way. It's quite a tricky one to get to, Harry. I'll have to take you. <laughs> You'll have to guide me, yeah. absolutely. Yes, well, we'll, we'll <laughs> barter. We'll, 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 we'll barter astro astronomy for uh, archaeoastronomy for photography, then. We'll, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the old fashioned way, bartering. One of the. Uh, well, you were mentioning also what you were saying about. Um, the holes in the in in, in the stones yeah. that they were there, and we mentioned this during Jackie's conversation as well, presentation. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about about that? Yeah. So, I, I, as I say, when I first looked at hole stones, um, I think the obvious thing that people think are they to look through? Do they? Do people? You know, actually go and look through them? But then I I, I tried to flip that on the head because. A lot of these sites would be quite uncomfortable to look through the, the holes. Certainly, Trevithy Coit is up above you, so you'd be crinking your neck. Mm -hmm. And um, the hold stones at Kenny Jack, um, you, you wouldn't want to be looking through them and watching a sunrise because you would blind yourself. So I started to think of, once again, the way that the shadows would play out on the floor. So, uh, and what would happen with those sunbeams on certain days of the year when you get the full sun coming through the hole. Uh, and, and it's quite an interesting effect. You, you do get, um, particularly with sunrise, the shadows are quite diffuse to start with, and then they become quite strong, the shadows. Uh, but then you get this beam of light coming straight through the hole onto the shadow itself. And whether they were used for that as uh, some sort of timing um, object or not, we don't know. Um, but it's certainly um, an interesting idea to add into the mix of, you know, I've. I've not, uh, I, I take lots of people on guided walks around there and I always ask them, what do you think these holes could have been used for? And other than um, and the idea that maybe they were a ritual thing, a bit like the men and told, but the holes themselves are quite small. So um, for hand festing, you couldn't get two hands in together or maybe it was for putting your hand through, but um, you would have had to have quite small childlike hands to go through them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's as good an idea as I've come across. So. <laughs> but we'll yeah. never know. That's mm. one of the exciting things about these sites is, you know, we can go and have ideas about them, but um, we're never really going to truly know if that's yeah, what they were used absolutely. for. And that's probably some of the wonder of them. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but one of the things, as you were, as you were speaking and telling us about that, the, the, the idea of a hole and light coming through a hole, I thought immediately, being a photographer, naturally the camera yeah. obscura. <laughs> yeah. yeah. With the camera obscura, the principle has been known since, uh, certainly since the Middle Ages. Um, uh, David yeah. Hockney's writing about how the, you know they used lenses, early len medieval lenses, to actually project images and then draw upon them. Blah blah blah, uh, changing art forever basically. Um, so maybe the, the, this idea of you know light and a hole going past through the light and then having a trajectory. Yeah. So the, this idea of light and, and it, time. It was quite a concentration of light as well, Harry. So if you put your hand behind that hole and the sun is coming through, it's ever so hot. 
Ah. Now, there's a real concentration of light coming through that hole, and it's it's almost like a pinhole camera, or as you say, a camera obscura. You've got that whole idea going on. Not that I, they probably used it like that, but there is a real concentration of light, and it would have, possibly would have been of interest to them. Yes, it would, no. I think it's 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 held that fascination. I think through since yeah. you know for 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 centuries. So that's great. Well. This has been a fantastic, fantastic talk, Carolyn. Thank you so much. It's been really quite a quite an eye opener. And thank you so much for everybody's participation. It's been absolutely great. There's been debate amongst the uh, amongst participants, and there's been some great comments and questions. So thank you all, and, uh, and, and, and you. a big thank you to you. Excellent. Uh, thank you for listening, everyone. <laughs> oh, there's, there's there's one last question that came, came okay. just has just come through. You mentioned the difficulty in dating these sites, but is there any suggestions as to how large a community was needed to build them at the same time as farming to stay alive? This is from John Webb. I, I think I would pass that one over to an archaeologist. <laughs> I, I, the only thing I'm going to say is that uh, uh, these were huge community projects and people must have had enough food and enough shelter to provide for their community, to, to have the time and the energy to spend on these community projects. So, um, yeah. But yeah. Also, I think, um, I totally agree on that one, but I also what, I, what I've been sort of, whilst out there photographing, I was thinking in terms of time, and we've been talking about time and the measurement of time, but also time scales then, these people would have been working on millennia. If you think of, for example, medieval buildings, medieval cathedrals in Europe, Notre Dame, all the big, you know, just, um, Canterbury and so on and so forth, they took centuries to build. Okay, they were much bigger, they were far more complex, but nevertheless, uh, there's a different time span. And I think these, these, these uh, Neolithic constructions would have taken a different type of, different, yeah, they, longer they amount of time. They, they certainly could have evolved over time. So they could have started with one circle and then added another and another and then, you know. It, yes. It, it, there's nothing to say that they set about a building project and had it all done within 15, 20 years. You know, it, exactly. it might have taken them, you know, and, and sites would have evolved over time, much as we, we change things. And, yeah, over yeah. generations, more like, more, yeah. in my opinion. Um, from Cal Calbook. Um, is there a possibility that the hole in the stones were formed by erosion, but were selected for aesthetics? Oh. Uh, the, there is possibilities that they were, because it would have taken an incredible amount of time to um, grind um, the holes into these, because they're granite. You know, it's incredibly hard rock. Particularly the men and toll, I, I hadn't noticed this, but I was pointed out this quite recently. If if you look at the men and toll, the actual hole is, is huge. It's like this donut thing that people climb through. But um, the it's it's not kind of a fully circular tubular d donut. It's its indentation is more on one side, and the suggestion is that it was laid flat, and it was one of these granite basin rocks which eroded through, and then it's been um, picked up and tipped on its side, and um, the hole made slightly bigger or, or something along those lines. And I did go right down there and check, and it, it, that does seem to be the case that um, it certainly eroded far more on one side of the tubular side, if you get what I mean, than the other. So that, that would suggest a, a, a partial natural erosion. So maybe it was part and part. Um, of course, yeah. of course. From Sheila, thank you, Carolyn. Lots to think about, indeed, absolutely. From Jackie, yes, Carolyn, you you are right there. And um, finally, from Anna, thank you, Carolyn. A really interesting talk. Well, yes, indeed. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. I think that on that note, sorry, we've gone a bit over, but it was well oh, worth okay. it. <laughs> Well done, guys. Fascinating conversation. Thank you and good night. Wine time. Yes, good idea. <laughs> Thanks. Wonderful talk and insights. Thank you, Harry and Carolyn. I really enjoyed this talk. 
Night, everyone. Thank you, Jem. That's really kind of you. Judith, thank you very much. Fascinating talk and wonderfully presented. It was indeed. Thank you so much, Judith. That's great. From Richard, thank you, Carolyn and Harry. Very welcome. Excellent. So, um, well, let's hope you, we can we we you, 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 we can have you again here and see the the next phase of of, of research. Um, yeah, I would be very interested to to collaborate with with Jackie and yourself to actually see if we can actually do more of these. I think that it's fascinating for me, and I think there's the there's a, there's an audience out there which is also really interested. So yeah, if we could do that in future, that would be great. Thank you both. This talk was. Awesome, says Cal. Call, great, excellent. And on that note, <laughs> and on that note, I'll say goodbye, Carolyn. Thank you so Bye. much. It's been a pleasure. We'll Bye. be in touch. Bye for now. Excellent. That's great. Okay. Well, this has been a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you so much for being here. Um, the gallery, this is the last in the series of talks this month, but the gallery will be um, having a guest. Um, exhibitor next month, um, New York street photographer uh, Massimo uh, Giacchetti and he'll be showing photographs of uh, New York and he'll be also be here in conversation and we're thinking of the idea of running some sort of workshop or something along the lines uh, of that but we'll see. Anyway, for me folks, good night, thank you so much, wish you all the best, see you next time, bye for now. <laughs>